painted all those dots black after I peeled the plastic, you know, the tape out of it. And then I used four or five colors that kind of match abalone, you know, greens and, and a slight bit of red, a little bit of gold, uh, blues, whatever, and just dotted all those things. And then when I peeled the tape off, it looked like I'd inlaid abalone into the mirror. And, you know, it was really easy to do and inexpensive. You can buy that. I buy the stuff called Joe Sanyo Iridescent Paints. For like $29, you get a kit that's got five or six different colors, and it lasts forever because you only use a tiniest amount. And you mix with it what's called Flow Extender. <clears throat> the Flow Extender, I don't know if you all have used any of that. Uh, the Flow Extender extends the drying time. So you dab this. It's called Flow Extender that you buy. It extends the drying time. And so what you can do is you can take a straw and blow it around. And that creates this kind of a cloud effect or whatever. And you can even dab it on. There's a lot of different things. If you go to YouTube and look up Cosmic Cloud Platter, that's how I learned to do it from the guy that did that video. Um, and it's a lot of fun. I've been having a ball playing with that stuff. Uh, what I find works really good that he didn't demonstrate well, that's one technique he didn't demonstrate. <laughs> but the other thing that I like on it, when you wood burn stuff, wood burning is black. Wood burning takes this iridescent paint really well. So you can add some really cool colors to your wood burning uh, techniques. You know, if you, especially if you've done like a textured pattern, you cover that whole textured pattern with green or blue or gold or whatever. It looks gorgeous and it's so easy to do. <clears throat> no. Well, sometimes, yeah, sometimes if it's charred really bad, I'll take a wire brush or a bristle brush and try to clean that char out before I put the paint on it. The paint kind of seals it to some point. Uh, the fluorescent paint that I'm using doesn't seal as well, and that's why I'll brush those with a brush if I would burn it or if I just char it, you know, put it on top. Um, Phil did demo on Cosmic Cloud. Cool. Uh, <clears throat> I know the handouts are online on some of the documents mm -hmm. that I use for that. Maybe that's it. It's just a handout. Good document. Are we ready to start? I don't know if everybody was here or not. Yeah, recording. Okay. All right. Uh, don't know if y'all, y'all know what heat shrink tubing is? Well, it's basically a tubing that you heat up with a heat gun or a match, and it shrinks, like, 50 or 60 percent of its normal size. That's the greatest thing in the world for tool covers. I put a little piece of dowel in here to kind of protect the point. Not to protect the point, but to keep the point from poking through the rubber. And then I hit it with heat shrink and I write on there what it is. So, you know, all my tools are protected this way for travel. It's a fantastic thing to do. Um, <clears throat> the other tip I wanted to give you that I didn't do earlier, when I buy wood, the, my, my local company that sells cabinet, cabinet wood, they'll sell me cheap wood that has deflects in it because the cabinet makers don't want those defects. It's got knots or it's got, you know, whatever in it. Uh, they'll sell it to me a little bit cheaper. And what I do is I take this square and I just walk around the wood. And I go, hey, there, there's a perfect mirror right there. And I'll mark it and I'll cut it out on the bandsaw. I use, I have a lot more waste doing it that way. But I get a lot nicer mirror, so I charge extra money for those uh, because they, you know, the, the knots and everything fits the pattern better. <clears throat> Otherwise, when I'm mass producing mirrors, I'll buy a one by six. I'll rip off one inch on both side on one side. That gives me my handles, and then I'll go down through there, and every five and a half inches, just chop it off. But when I do that, you know, the grain goes wherever, the knots go wherever, and they're okay for you know for a mirror that I sell for thirty-five dollars. But my fancier mirrors, I want to sell, you know, up to 75. Uh, what we found at the craft center and one other place where I was trying to sell mirrors, 75 in my area was the limit. Those sit there. $55, fair amount, 45, 35, sell okay. I'm told by the people that sell in the big markets that my, my nicer mirrors would easily sell for $125, if not more. I don't know. Maybe I'll find out one of these days. <laughs> yeah. <clears throat> another another tip on I used to do a lot of inlay with inlays or epoxy uh, you know you always get little tiny bubbles and so I'm trying to turn those away don't turn them too far <laughs> you 
you, you don't realize that your, your inlay really wasn't that deep <laughs> until you find out the hard way. Uh, I've made about every mistake you can make on hand mirrors. Um, I wrote this article <clears throat> was in uh, uh, Wood Turning Fundamentals, I think in January or February, I forget which issue. So if you want a, an article on how to do these uh, lantern ornaments, uh, what happened was one of our guys, we had a new member come in, and he's going absolutely nuts on turning ornaments. He turned 400 for us last year. Our club sold $16,000 worth of ornaments. We're talking about 35 members, made 900 ornaments to sell. <laughs> but anyway, this guy invented these, and, and uh, I loved them. I just thought, this is fantastic. I went back, and I made my own version, and I went back to... Dennis, and I said, Dennis, you ought to write an article for the journal. They'd love this. He said, I don't want to do it. You write it. So I wrote it, and I gave him credit on how to do it. And then I started doing my own styles to kind of take away from his. But they're so simple. What you do is, if you want four holes, we'll talk about more holes later. But if you want four holes in it, you drill the holes first while the wood's still square. Seven-eighths of an inch. Well, it varies a little bit. Um, if you use a bigger bit, this whole this slot right here gets real thin. And so, you know, you may have to do a test sometimes to see. The wood I use is about two and an eighth. You can get by with two inches, but it doesn't give you much playroom. You gotta get it centered just right and you gotta clean it off with a parting tool just right. Not parting tool, spindle roughing couch, just right, or you have problems. I'll pass that around. You don't necessarily have to drill halfway through. You gotta drill deep enough that as you get into it, just covered. And yeah. so, yeah. He's talking about the journal. For those of you who don't know, the American Association of Woodburners, the AAW, and the uh, other one you mentioned, the fundamentals. Wood Turning Fundamentals. It's also part of the AAW. It's online. You can download it. But you have to be AAW member. Yeah. So that the AAW gives you, when you join, and it's like $68 a year now. Yep. Uh, yeah, four of each. Is it four of each or six of each or twelve? Six. It's every other month, so it's six of each. Yeah. Six of the yep. Yep. The fundamentals is online only, the American Wood Turner can be either way depending on your membership. The sixty-eight dollars gets you the paperback version. Uh, I think you can get by maybe 10 bucks cheaper if you go digital only. I don't know. I hadn't looked. Um, the biggest advantage, however, of being an AAW member, there's two advantages. One is you have access to 35 years of back issues. You can't believe how much information is there. I mean, all the top turners in the world have written articles for that magazine, and you have access to them if you get a membership. The other thing I think that's really valuable to new turners, <clears throat> they have previewed a lot of the videos that are on YouTube by whoever and said, this is a good video safety-wise and skill-wise. You know, if you've looked on YouTube, there's a lot of videos out there that are horrible. <laughs> I mean, I look at them and going, why would you even put that on the web? But so anyway, those are the two biggest advantages, I think, of, of being a member. Um, so anyway, uh, what I do is I mount it with the holes to the right. This is going to be the top. This I'm just going to grip with in a minute, and you'll see that. Uh, I'm doing the same technique I did earlier. Do it. Oh, okay. Where there it is. I rarely use a helmet at home because 99% of everything I turn is small. <laughs> it's not a big deal. I am, I do wear a respirator when I'm sanding, and I have a dust collector pulling out sanding dust the whole time I'm turning, as much as it can. But. Uh, So I just want to get this around. Now what happens is, when you go across that area where the holes are, the tool wants to dive in. So again, this is, I, I stress to everybody, don't lose, use a lot of pressure on the bevel. You need to learn to cut without doing that pressure. But it's really important when you're doing over a hole area like that. We call it turning air. And when you're turning air, you gotta be really gentle because it'll cut three or four times as fast in that area. 
Now all I'm doing initially, I just want to get it round enough to turn a tenon on this end. Now my chuck takes a dovetail tenon. So those of you who are new at turning, your tenon needs to match your jaws shape-wise. It needs to be shorter so it doesn't bottom out in the, in the chuck. And, and it needs to have a shoulder. What keeps these things from flying out of the chuck is that shoulder. Because when you're turning, it's trying to vibrate. And what it'll do is it'll dig in and eventually it'll just fall out. When you have that shoulder on there, it can't do that, that shifting. Um, now, something that I'm doing on these, and you can't do it with every drive center, if your drive center has a shoulder on it, you can use it in your chuck. So, you know, when I'm mass producing these things, I don't ever take my chuck off the lathe. I just use that like that. It won't hurt your drive center at all. Um, put that back in. What I do is I bring the center up. Put that back in there. Yeah, that squares it up. Before I tighten these down all the way, otherwise it can shift a little tiny bit. So then turn it back on. See, it's running true. At this point in time, you didn't really need to do this last step. There's two flat areas right there, right there, actually three. So it's not quite round, but it doesn't matter at this stage because what I'm going to do is drill the holes. We put a drill chuck in that side. Can't get my magnet off there. I said I didn't have a magnet earlier, and I lied. I do. Because <laughs> I've got a little bitty drill bit. Um, I'm not sure what size those are <laughs> exactly. What I do is, well, I don't need it. Um, where did I lay the, oh, there they are. Um, when you buy your tea lights, there's two types of tea lights. There may be even more. I don't know but they vary in size very slightly <laughs> these are like 30 35.3 millimeter they don't fit any of your drill bits <laughs> uh, there's some that are 35 millimeter or some that are a little bit bigger uh, the lights that i buy are called timed lights the different and they're two dollars a piece versus one dollar a piece the regular ones you turn on they'll run for about a thousand hours they got a replaceable battery i think it's a 2032 um, and uh, they're a dollar a piece. The timed lights, they're $2 a piece, but what they do is they stay on for six hours and turn off for 18. So I can put them out there like at Christmas season. I can turn it on and just ignore it. It'll turn itself on, you know, say at 6 o'clock at night, turn back off at midnight. Tomorrow night at 6 o'clock, it'll turn itself back on. So the battery lasts a really long time, but I found that's a huge selling point. When I tell people that it does that, they, 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 they want to buy it. They're so excited about it. Um, I don't even know if they like the ornament. They just want to buy the, the tea light. Do it. I get them on Amazon. Uh, you could probably just do a Google search for timed tea lights and probably come up with a whole bunch of them. The day that I bought these, I was in a hurry, and I went to Amazon. They had them. I had next day shipping, so I got it. It's great. Uh, but, what I, but what I do is... <clears throat> I measure them, I drill a hole, make sure the hole's big enough. In this case, whatever bit this is, which I'm going to say is one and a quarter, but I'm not sure. Not written on the shank? No, not on these. These are cheap bits. Um, it's a hair too small. I'm going to show you how I get around that in a minute. When you have a bigger one, what you, what you simply do is I use white um, E6000 glue or white... Uh, caulking and what you do is you put an extra large bead on on the inside of the thing and put your thing in there and let it dry so even if the hole's too large it'll work i like this method because it fits really close it looks a little more professional when you're done 
But what we do is, make sure I got the right bit in there. You drill a hole, the depth of your, a hair deeper than your tea light is. So it won't, you know, the wood will sit rather than tea light itself on the wood. And turn the speed down, because you're drilling directly into end grain. It's gonna smoke and burn, whoa. I thought I had that tight. These are cheap bits. They don't drill worth a darn. <laughs> I found some the other day. There's a company out there called Infinity. Sells woodworking gear. They sell the best uh, Forester style bits I've ever seen. They have grooves in them. They don't burn. They cut really clean. For a whole set, it's three hundred forty-nine dollars. <laughs> but yeah, well, I, I don't know if anybody makes the fish bits anymore. I can't find them. Do what? Yep, yep. Yeah, you can. But these are these are reasonably new. They just don't cut all that good, but it was like 80 bucks for a set. I had the same set for 35 years, I guess, <laughs> and I'd sharpen them periodically. And I finally decided, you know, it's probably time for me to buy another set. <laughs> um, I'm cheap. I'm not that cheap. Um, so I drill this. It's not quite an inch, give or take a little bit. Um, you can put your, you know, take your T-light, measure it, see what you need. You want just a little bit deeper. And then the advantage of drill, pre-drilling the holes is I can see how deep this one goes. Normally, I make a mark that's two inches deep, and I drill that deep, or just a little beyond two inches deep. Um, and I'll show you on the other ones why that's a problem or not a problem, whichever. Also, the nice thing about pre-drilling... It drills faster through there and it doesn't heat up the bit. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> if you're going to drill fairly deep, you want to back this bit out fairly often to clear because when you get a Forrester bit stuck inside one, there's no getting it out. You have to destroy the work to get it out. Uh, okay, that's got the that's got the hollowing done. Do you like my hollowing tools? <laughs> Much easier. I want to do one more thing to show you what the difference is. Oops, does this one not self eject? Oh, I guess not. It, it does, but not on that particular thing. Yep, I've had that problem. My, my uh. <clears throat> I have two lays. I've got a, a Powermatic 3520 and I've got a Delta MIDI. And I had to drill and tap the end and put a screw in with a spacer. And it had to be just right to self eject on both lays. <laughs> it took a fair amount of experimentation to get it to work. What I'm going to do is I'm going to clean up the bottom. Let's get rid of those. Is it important that uh, the size? No, what I'm trying to do is get a shoulder. I want this to be as big as I can, but if I have a shoulder, the T-light goes in there better. You don't need it. Like I say, you could drill one bit all the way through. Um, the reason I do two sizes is I want to recess this area farther than that area. In other words, I've been doing details kind of like this, you know. I want this area to be lower than that area because I just think it looks better. And that's the main reason I do the two sizes. Oh, I'm going to talk to you about that in a minute, but <laughs> not yet. So I want to clean this up. It's, it's not quite flat. When you start a cut across a piece like that, if you have the flute exactly pointing to 180, it won't kick back on you so much. If you have it open like that, it's really easy to do. So if I line that up straight up and down, I can start that cut. Once you get a shoulder established, it's no problem. It'll, it'll go ahead and cut. And 
And then what I do is, uh, and this is a little bit tricky, but I use the lower wing. I, I position the bowl gouge so that it's going to cut with this wing. This wing is almost touching the wood. That way it becomes a scraper. You got to keep the handle level. And that's all it takes, I think. We're going to find out because I'm going to stick a piece in there and see. One more pass, <laughs> apparently. It's still not. I don't have it. I think it's not true. So we'll do a little bit more. You're using a reasonably thick bead of that glue, so there we go. Now I didn't, I may not have drilled it deep enough, although that works actually because the feet show. But we'll put the drill bit on there and do it again just to get a better looking one. What I usually do is I drill it to where there's, eh, I didn't go far enough, yeah, you know, right about there. I drill it till there's about an eighth of an inch beyond the thickness of my bit, and I didn't do that. That's why it does that. So now we go back and start on the outside. What I do is, like I say, the T-light goes to about there, right there. Well, I got to round this up more first. It's still flat, but just a hair beyond those holes is where my stopping point is. Now I have a pretty light touch, so I can get away with that. But if you don't, ooh, getting some tear out there. Um, if you have a large live center, some of them have big cones you can put on, some don't. You can bring that up. You don't want to put a lot of pressure on, just a little bit. And that allows you to be a little more aggressive. I talked about using that wing as a skew. That's what I'm doing now. Because right there, it's going to be so delicate. So I'll take my parting tool, and I'm going to go about, not quite a quarter of an inch, about that much right there. Now, a trick that I do with my parting tool is I use it like a skew. I'll tilt it sideways just a little bit. I'll cut with the middle of it. And it cleans up that area just like a skew would. It takes me a lot less sanding later on. We'll take my spindle gouge and I'm going to round this over. Round that over. Come on, you can do it. Just extremely light cuts is all I'm doing. It's hard to describe to people. I had a friend that turned these hollow vessels that had big openings in them. And the inside of his vessels, you really couldn't sand because you couldn't put anything in there. Those openings would grab the sandpaper or whatever. And the inside of his vessels were just immaculate. And he told me what he does, and he used a scraper. Remember those ones I passed around, about that big, whatever? 
he used something like that. And he said, what I'm doing is I'm touching that wood. If you can imagine taking your fingernail, going across the back of your hand and barely touching. He said, that's what I'm doing on the inside of the wood for those last few passes. And uh, I've been practicing that. I'm learning, but got a ways to go. So I got that flattened. <clears throat> I want to go back and flatten this a little bit more than that. What I do here, I take really light cuts with my parting tool. And I go back and look, turn the lathe off and go, how deep can I go? Now see, the wall's pretty darn thick right there. So I can go a lot th thinner. So we'll lower, take that down more. And what I'm doing is I'm looking at the back side of the piece and I'm watching that silhouette and so that shows me exactly when to stop with the tool, or at least pretty darn close. There we go. Okay, that's not too bad. It could go a little thinner. I'm going to go just a little bit more. Keep forgetting to pull this down, don't I? <laughs> At the AAW, they would have shot me by now for not using the face shield. There we go. That's not bad. Now, one thing I like to do, uh, I think it looks better. Let's see if I got that one around. Yeah, this is the last one I did. And what I did was I tapered these areas. I think that looks better than leaving it straight. For the, at least for the ones with the holes in it. So, so I'm going to do that on this. I'm going to taper it. And what I'm going to do is the same thing I talked about earlier. As I rotate the gouge and I make that cut, what I do is that I rotate it enough that that wing is going to hit this area. It's not going to cut. So it's safe. If I keep the gouge in this position, when I hit that shoulder, it can jerk it over and give me a catch. So... But right here in the middle, you can barely touch the wood and take wood off. You have to be just super light if you're going to do that. I rub the bevel. I lift it up till it starts to cut. And I'm just barely touching it. Right there. There we go. Stop and check and see. It's... It's pretty fair, not bad. I didn't get it centered perfectly, uh, and I may not have drilled the holes perfectly last night. Um, you'll see this very thin gap right here, quite a bit more gap here. So it's real important to make sure everything lines up when you drill your holes from the start and when you mount it on the lathe. I wanted to do that so I could show you all the problems, and I almost went too far, <laughs> but we got it. So then I, uh, I start turning the top, but I don't turn all of it, and I'll show you why. Um, turn that. One of the tricks I use when I turn, when you have the handle up like that, it becomes a scraper. Cuts very quickly, but the direction of cut doesn't matter. I turn it back over, rub the bevel to finish up the cuts. I don't want to take this down to full depth just yet. I'm going to go about there. Because what I'm going to do is add some texture. And the texture kind of pushes it a lot. It'll flex it. So I'll leave this kind of thick for where I think I might want to stop my texture. And so we'll slow it down. Well, normally what I would do is sand real lightly. I'll do that with this piece of sandpaper that I laid down somewhere. Oh, I know where it is. It's right there.
Yeah, this, uh, these belts they use for metal cutting, they'll sand all day long. They're fabulous. Now, when you're trying to sand that, I find it better put your hands underneath and pull like that. If you put your lathe in reverse, you can put your hands on top and do it. But you want it to try to pull the sandpaper away from you. I just wanted to sand that just a tiny bit so the texture shows better. So we'll lower that down. We'll pull it back a ways. There we go. And <clears throat> different, different texturing tools leave different patterns. You just have to kind of play. There we go. Uh, let's do one underneath the lip here. Now, just for interest's sake, if I can find what I did with my chatter tool. <laughs> there it is. Nope, that's not it. Oh, we could, or I've got regular colored pins. Um, I made this tool before I moved, I obviously needed it. I ground it very carefully and very precisely. I got to my new house a year later or so, pulled this tool up, I have no earthly idea what I was gonna use it for. <laughs> if y'all can figure it out. I thought I was using it for cutting tenons, but why would I do this side? I don't know, it was fun. Fun making it, but I have no earthly idea what the heck it's for. <laughs> I gave away a huge number of jigs when I moved because I had no place to put them. And I, I realized that some of those jigs, I had no earthly idea what I used them for. <laughs> but I needed them real bad, so I built it. Uh, to use a chatter tool, you want to use it down around 7 o'clock or so. If it makes that noise, it's working. I was teaching a class or doing demos for an elementary school. And I don't like the way that looks. It's tearing the wood too much. Sometimes it does that. So we'll just change it. What we'll do is we'll get my gouge out. That's one nice thing about chatter tool or any of these textures actually. Most of the time you can go back and just get rid of them. Make sure it's gone. To learn to use a chatter tool, what I do is I get a dowel like this. It only works on end grain. That's part of why this is not working right. It's kind of side grain and end grain. Uh, but <clears throat> what I do is I, cut, I true the end up. I take my chatter tool and I make designs on there. You can tilt it this way or tilt it that way. And if I like it, I save it. What I do is I take a parting tool, cut down, and I leave it like a little button. You know, it's that big around. It's got little three-eighths or half-inch tenon on it. And what I can do then is when I make boxes, I can just drop this in there. Yep. If I, if I don't like it, I cut it off and make another one. And so, you know, you learn to use the tool real quickly by doing that. You know, a dowel this long, you can probably get a dozen or 15 or more out of it. And that also helps you. Uh, it works better with the really exotic woods. And so it saves you money because, you know, you got this big dowel down there. It costs you $25. You don't want to use it up as, as one big spindle. So you can use chatter tools on it. It works great. But that one didn't look so good on this wood, so we'll go back to one of these tools. I'll use this little texturing one. Pull that out just a little bit. Okay, that kind of looks like a roof. If you want to call it a roof, I don't know. I'll take my skew and I'll highlight those areas just a little bit. A little dot right there. A little line right there. I don't know if this one needs it or not. Nah, we'll leave that one alone. 
straight in with a heel of that? With a toe? I mean the toe. Yeah. All, all I'm trying to do is, is cut a little tiny groove. A lot of people, and I do at home, a lot of people use what they call a three-point tool. It's got, I don't know why they call it three-point. It's got three flats. <laughs> it comes to a point and use those, and that works really good. But once I've done that, I've got it. Uh, if you want to sand the inside, I don't recommend sticking your fingers in there. <laughs> it, you know, it wants to grab you. You could, you could get by with it a little bit. What I do is uh, I take my little two-inch discs. This has got uh, Velcro glued to it. I take my little two-inch discs, and sometimes I actually cut them with the scissors so it wraps around better. But you can go in there and you know, kind of sand a little bit. doesn't need it much. The other tool that I use that I hope I brought with me, yeah, there it is. You can buy these little sanding sticks in the, craft, in the model section of Hobby Lobby. They're abrasive, and they're pointed. And you want to go in there, and you got a little tear out. You know, around the hole, just go in there and clean that up. You could take sandpaper, just glue it to a dowel, of course. We got a little bit right there. That's pretty good. Okay. Then what we do is turn the top part, and I like to make it roughly a half an inch. Doesn't have to be perfect. I've got this little bitty wrench that I got with who knows what years ago. I kind of use that to roughly size it. Take my gouge, not that one, I want the smaller one. My little 3 8 gouge. And I go finish turning that part right there. I like to have a tiny little cove where the handle's gonna go. I think it looks better. So I'll kind of put that in there. I'll start rounding that over. And for now, that's as far as I'm gonna go. Usually I would have sanded the whole thing. Once I put the texture on, I would have hit it really lightly with 600 grit just to take the fuzzies off. I'm going to go back and sand this just a tiny bit. Sand that real lightly, that real lightly. What, the reason I wanted to sand it lightly for you is to show you how I use the colored pins. And I laid my red one out somewhere. There it is. Okay. And we'll do... We'll do green for the bottom. Um, one trick is don't stick them in like this or like that. It just eats up your point. If you point it down, it actually sharpens your point a little bit. Yep, a lot. <laughs> yeah, what he's talking about is you cut a little groove in there and you take something like a guitar string or a piece of copper wire or whatever and you wrap it around it and you burn it, you spin it at high speed so it creates friction and it burns a groove. Don't wrap the wire around your fingers. Make little handles because if it grabs, it'll cut your finger off. Uh, but it works really well. I'm going to pull that off because we don't need it for the, for the last little cut. Um, and I put my finish on. I use Q-tips sometimes to put finish on the inside if I want to. I've even painted a few of them on the inside. I don't know if I did any of these. Nope. But what I want to show you before we get off of here is a couple of fun things. Number one is a drill guide. 
Anybody need to drill holes in their bowls? Maybe you're making a clock. You want to drill the holes for dowels for the clock movement or whatever. Instead of buying all those fancy drill guides, this is what I make. I turn this to fit there. <clears throat> you know, I line it up. Well, it won't go because this is too long. <laughs> I line it up with the hole I want. I take whatever drill bit I want, feed it through there. Now, if I'm going to use spade bits or forester bits, uh, and I'm not sure this one was set up for any of those. Yeah, it is there. I put the drill on afterwards. So the drill's, you know, size for that shank. But I can put in there. I can drill holes at an angle. I can drill holes straight on. It's a really versatile tool. And these things, you know, only take me five minutes to make. I drill the holes on the drill press so they're square through. That's the only really, I call it complex part. <clears throat> but rather than buying like that one-way drill jig or anything like that, I use these and it works fantastic. That's how I did this one. Uh, what I did on this was um, when I had it on here, I used my index wheel. And I decided, well, there needs to be, I don't know how many holes, 12 holes. <laughs> So I took the 36 and divided it by 12, and I would move my spacer bar however far, and I'd drill a hole, pull this out, move it, drill another hole, pull this out, move it, drill another hole, and then I would move the drill guide over and drill the center set of holes, and move it over, drill the last set of holes. Um, <clears throat> the jig that I'm using, this is, there's a bunch of different um, index wheels on the market. I have all of them. Uh, the Iron Fire is the least expensive. About $29. I can't remember who you buy it from right now. It's the guy that sells the router stuff. Um, it'll hit me in a minute, maybe. <clears throat> but when you buy it, you don't get an indexing block. All you get is a little, piece of a little piece of steel that goes in the holes. You have to build your own index block some way or another. Um, my first index wheel didn't have any of these. What it was was just a round disc. I had an L-shaped block of wood on here, and I would simply clamp it. I'd already taken my dividers and divided off. When you want to do really odd numbers, like 7 or 5 or 13, none of the index wheels have those numbers. So that's where that thing comes in handy. I can step it off with my dividers, and then all I'll do is line it up with the top of my dowel and clamp it, and I'm ready to make a jig. This one I came up with, um, it's spring-loaded. It's, you know, it's just, it's just a... 3 sixteenths piece of steel rod. I bent it 90 degrees. I sharpened the end to a point. What I did first was I sharpened it to a point using my drill on my grinder, and then I took my torch, heated it up, and bent it 90 degrees. Then I glued it in a 3 sixteenths hole with CA glue, and when it got dry, I took my pliers and I twisted it 90 degrees. The reason I did that is, and again, this will work on my Powermatic and not on this one, my, my chucks, a lot of have index wheels, sometimes pins in the back, some in the sides. I can rotate this thing 90 degrees and use that instead of this if I want to. gives me that option. But the nice thing about this is, like I say, once I get it lined up, all I have to do is pull that out, rotate it how many holes, drop it back in, it's ready to go. Real simple little system to use. Uh, the other index wheels I have, I have the Alisam index wheel. Um, it comes with a really, really nice index pin system. It's magnetic. It sits on here and magnet, magnetized to the bed. So you can actually pull it out of the hole, let it drop back in, or it has a spring-loaded plunger that will pull out and lock back in. It's nice. It has more accurate holes than this and more holes than this one. Uh, the one that I really like, and I still use that pin with it a lot of times, that's the reason I made it cone-shaped is it will fit any size hole up to 3 30 seconds. Um, the uh, Chefware Kits sells an index wheel. Theirs has more than anybody else. The two outside rows are set up to do um, basket weave illusions, 96 holes, and I forget what the other size is. you know, Sammy? Anyway, it's a whole garbage load of holes. <laughs> yeah, something like that. But anyway, uh, so it has a huge variety, and they, give you, they all give you a little chart. Kind of looks like that. And it'll tell you how many holes you got for this and how many holes you got for that. Um, you can easily do it mathematically. You know, they got on here 14, 36, 48, and 60. So I can just divide a number into that. Um, the way I test it to find out what I need a lot of times is I'll take this. 
I'll wrap a piece around here like that. I'll put a mark on both of them, take it back off, <laughs> lay it on the bed. I can measure between those two marks. Say I have so many inches or so many millimeters, and I can simply say, okay, I'm using a quarter inch bit. How many times does that divide into this with a little bit of space between them? And I automatically know which index holes to use then. So it saves a lot of time and hassle and doesn't involve math. <laughs> Very easy. Um, Yeah, yeah. Like I say, all you do is, you, and I prefer to use a hardwood if I can. I've got some made out of pine for like one-time usage. But uh, what I do is I turn this to match my uh, banjo. And, so, and, and low enough that this will actually center, center or go up above the piece, one or the other. And then I simply drill holes. And you'll see I've got, they're labeled. Uh, 9 30 seconds, 3 eighths, half inch, 16, 19 60 ninths. <laughs> quarter inch, five sixteenths, whatever. Uh, and so I just custom make them when I need them for whatever drill bit that I need. Um, what was the other thing I was going to tell you? Oh, okay, we're going to talk about the router. Uh, well, if you turn it thin, okay, without drilling any holes at all, then you can go back and pierce. You know, it's got to be one or two millimeters thick to be able to pierce fairly easily. I don't know how many of y'all have done piercing. Um, you can do piercing with a Dremel if you have a real steady hand. The problem with the Dremel is it wants to follow the grain because it's only running at, oh, I don't know, 20, less than 50,000 RPM, whatever it is. Um, the high speed that they actually do piercing with run at 400,000 RPM, and they're literally like writing with a pencil. They don't follow the grain at all. Um, to do the routed one, what I do is, when I use my router on the lathe to do that, or you want to do this kind of thing, uh, what you can do is you build yourself a table or a platen. That goes in here. Uh, this won't go low enough because this is a jet and mine's a Powermatic. But what I do is I've got spacers that I cut out of PVC pipe so that when I put the lathe, you build a, the lathe, <laughs> the router. You build a carriage for your router. I like to have extra bases. I've got a base that has one pin. I've got a base that has two pins. I've got a base that has no pins. <laughs> because different projects require, when you're, what you're trying to do is use those pins to follow a guide. In this case, I'm following this straight guide. Um, and what I use to determine a lot of that is this. This is set up to the same height as my router. So what I can do is go on there and draw lines and make sure that what I did mathematically or with my tape works out. Because sometimes it doesn't. And it also gives you, a, when you're going through here and you're trying to count six or eight or 12 holes, it's easy to miss a hole. If you already have lines there, you go, oh, that's not right, I need to go one more hole. Saves a lot of hassle. And I made this one adjustable because depending on what basis I put on here, it may vary slightly. Um, this one is for flat or convex bases. The one with one pin is for concave because I need to follow it, you know, like that when I'm routing. Um, and, uh, and I use these to get the router either dead center or above or below center. When you do things dead center, everything points at the center. If I raise the lathe above center, it, it, it still points at the center, but what it looks like when you get finished is it looks like it spirals around the piece. If you mount it below center, it goes the opposite direction. So you can actually do this where you have lines that go this way and lines that go that way and intersect each other, which is kind of cool uh, for some stuff. But uh, anyway, so I use these things to get the right height. And I found this one day when I was playing. It's just a piece of pipe fitting. I don't know what the heck it is. It was a Lowe's <clears throat> and it's adjustable. So I can really, really sneak up on getting it exact. And the reason I do that is sometimes I'll cut a V-groove, glue a piece of wood in. I have to take the piece off the lathe to get all the wood glued on and all that kind of stuff. Put it back on the lathe, face it off. Then I want to put another piece in the center of that piece. Well, that means that when I put it back on the lathe, it may not go back on the lathe absolutely perfectly. By using this thing, I can move it up and down in thousandths of an inch and really nail it, or at least get pretty darn close. So, 
Okay. Yeah, this goes underneath here, okay. you know, on that rod. And to make this faceplate, um, all you do is you take, uh, there's, there's several ways, a bunch of ways to do it, actually. You could actually make this out of wood. It obviously won't last as long if you do that. But <clears throat> what I did was um, I cut threads in this and threaded it into that piece right there. You could have somebody weld a washer on the top. Any way that you can get this piece 90 degrees to that piece and have places to mount screws on. Uh, I've made thicker blocks of wood and simply glued a metal d dowel in there. Worked fine with epoxy. Doesn't have to be screwed in or welded in or whatever. You don't want to. Uh, but then what you do is, once you get all that set up, put that back. Again, I use my index pin, which I just took off, didn't I? Okay. Um, what I'll do is I'll put stops on here. I'll just C-clamp them on or hot glue them in place so that it goes from here to there and stops. So I know I'm getting the exact same cut every time. And I'll just, I'll rotate this, you know, kind of plunge it in, make a cut left and right, make sure it's clean, do it again, do it again, whatever, just keep indexing it and doing it over and over and over until you get what you want. On something like this, what I do is I tilt the jig so it runs out of the cut. And, and to make the V-cuts, huh? That's how you get the tapered. Yeah, that's how I get the tapered. And the way I get the pointed one is um, I started off doing it, and I can't get that out of there. Come on, come on, baby. There we go. I started off using these 90-degree cutters. The problem is the middle of that cutter is moving very slow. Surface speed, it always left the bottom of the cut dull. So when I, when I made my blocks of wood to fit in there, I kind of had to sand off that corner, which was a pain in the butt. So then I came up with the idea one day, and sure enough, I don't have it in here. <laughs> That's okay, it's close enough. Um, I figured out that if I take a flat, a straight cutting router bit, and I mount it 45 degrees, it cuts with the corner. The corner is moving very rapidly. I get a very clean cut. So, you know, I got a jig. My router sits like that. So I can, I can do that kind of cut with it. It also changes the look. If you have a round cutter in there, it'll change from being a smooth round cove to kind of a lopsided cove, which is kind of cool. So it's just fun playing with both alternatives. But uh, anyway, that's the basics. And like I say, you know, you get whatever kind of index wheel, you rig it up, you build a router table, you build a router stand, and you're ready to go. It's it's fairly simple process. The one problem I did run into in cutting V-jigs is apparently the router must move almost imperceptibly as I cut them, and so the hole is never 90 degrees, even though the cutter is 90 degrees. It'll be like 87, 88. I didn't show you that. <laughs> Should have. So what I made was this little jig. right there and it says it is 93 degrees so what i do is um, i'll set up my table saw and i'll cut those blocks of wood that go into that at 93 degrees instead of 90. and so now they fit down that v groove perfectly what happened was i was cutting v grooves and i drop put that square piece of wood in there and it would rock in the groove so i knew it wasn't cutting accurately it's leaving a, it's leaving a slightly enlarged hole so I just hand, you know, hand filed that till it fit perfectly, you know, visually through the light. And that's what I use to set up my table saw tilt to get that. The hard part about that is when you have a square dowel, it's really hard to see that this side is 93 and that side's 87. <laughs> so what I do is when I cut them, I know the tilt of the blade. When I cut them, I take a magic marker and mark the bad side. And now when I try to glue that square block into that V-cut, I know the magic mark always goes up, and I don't screw up gluing them in. So, uh, Everybody understand this? You know, if you're, if you're interested, if you go on YouTube and you type in John Lucas Router Demo, a uh, club out of Atlanta did an hour and a half, well, I did an hour and a half demo for them, and they recorded it, and it's online, and it covers probably 95% of all my techniques. I've changed some things since then, very slightly, 
But for the most part, it covers what I do. So John, if you're really in doubt. When you did your 45 uh, jig, yep. did you make it adjustable or is it fixed? It's fixed. It's fixed. I thought about making it adjustable, decided I probably wouldn't use that, and it, and it complicated the jig a whole lot. <laughs> so. So, we're about to wrap up, just about. Oh, before I take it off, what I do is, and I laid it down here and now lost it. There it is. Little bitty drill bit. You figure out what kind of wire you want as the handle. Um, I like this copper wire, but you can buy wire in all kinds of colors. I mean, you can get gold and bronze and black and green and all kinds of things. Uh, I like that copper wire. I don't know what size it is. Does it say on there? 7.62, no, that, that's, that's not right. <laughs> oh, 18 gauge is what that is. Anyway, what I do is I turn this so that the side grain is pointing at me. And then I start the hole. I get it started when I can. I think I bent that bit. <laughs> There we go. And I found that a half inch is a pretty good size overall. So what I do is I just take a, you know, half inch bit, I mean half inch tool, and I wrap it around that. And that gives me the size I need. And then I kind of eyeball where to bend it, which is like right about there. And I bend it 90 degrees. I missed it just a little bit. Let's go down a little more. Right there. And then I take my little needle nose pliers. Cut that off. If you get them too long, they butt against each other and won't squeeze in as far as you want to. So let's turn this off of here real quick. Y'all ever had a good friction burn? Touch that. <laughs> it will burn your hands. <laughs> this plastic. And what's interesting about that <clears throat> is they folded that thing up and stuck it in my mailbox. I got it and thought, well, crap, this is ruined. I'm going to have to call them back. Well, I laid it home, and the next morning when I went out to to get this thing and call the guy and take a picture. It was flat as could be. Been using it every, and I've used this, gosh, probably 15 years. And every now and then I forget, like I did a while ago, I'll leave it engaged and turn the lathe on, and it kind of kicks it out of there. Hasn't damaged it to make it unusable. Uh, I still haven't thought of the name of that company that sells this now. You could probably just do a search for Iron Fire uh, Index Wheel. Yep. It's the company that makes a lot of other router jigs, and I can't remember what their name is. You know when it'll hit me. About 200 miles from here on the road. <laughs> I, put, I forced the cut a little bit too much. I got a hole in the top. It's not a very big hole, but a little bitty one. If that's the president calling me, tell him I'm not interested. No. <laughs> Straighten that out just a little bit. There you go. 
And of course, like I say, you, oh, I didn't show you the glue, but what I use is the white, um, the white E6000. And the only reason I do that is because these things are white. Now I have painted them. Sometimes I painted the inside and I painted the top of the, the tea light. But it doesn't take paint very well. I don't know what they're made of. But uh, anyway, that's one option. This part right here, if y'all are ever interested, I do a little bit of metal spinning. Uh, that's a really cool thing to do. You take a flat disc, you have a form like this, you run your tailstock up and hold it in place, and you literally force it around it while it's spinning. It's a really cool process. So that's what I... Did you use a wheel to rub against it? A roller? No. no. You can when you're rolling the bead, like if you if you got a piece and you want to roll a thick bead on it, you start that bead that way and get it rolled over pretty good, and then you take a little small wheel that looks like the little guide wheels on the bottom of your sliding doors, except it's steel, and, uh, and you kind of force that against it and roll it around a little bit, and it, and it forces that bead closed, which is pretty nice. But sometimes you just use a stick. You don't even need the metal oh, tools. Big, yeah. Wooden, wooden rock, yeah, I mean, big, thick one, because what you're doing is you got a tool down here, and you've got it underneath your armpit. Let's just pretend like that's one. Most of the time, it's a polished piece of metal. You got it down like that, and you got a pin, and you're, you're forcing it against that pin, and you go back, forward and back. If you don't go forward and back, what happens is if all you do is go forward, it thins out the metal, and it breaks right there because it got too thin. So you have to go forward and then come back, and then go forward and go back. And that's a pretty cool process. It's with copper and brass and aluminum. Well, yeah, you got to grease the surface. I use Dove soap. Works pretty good. Um, it work hardens, and it won't bend anymore without breaking. So you have to heat it up red hot and then, then quench it. It's exactly, the, it's exactly like you would harden steel, but it anneals this. And then you put it in an acid to kind of clean it off because, you know, the fire changes all the colors. And then you go back and you hopefully finish your project on the next pass. Uh, something that small you can do without work hardening it, probably, if you've done it right. It's a cool process. John, that company is Workshop Supply. Workshopsupply.com. Hmm. That doesn't sound right, but it could be. I didn't remember that either, but. Huh. Um, it's one of those things that will hit me sooner or later. Yeah. Anyway, anybody have any questions? Anybody have any questions about anything else to do with turning? <laughs> Back to this morning when you put the file in the oven, what temperature? 425 degrees. It's not critical. 4 to 500? Huh? 4 to 500? Well, say 4 to 450. You start getting up toward 500, the metal's going to get too soft. So how long now for each? A half hour per quarter inch of thickness. So what I do, 99 times out of 100, the steel that I'm using is, you know, right around that range. So I throw them in there for a half hour, forget it, and it works fine. Seems to have anyway. I have to do that when my wife is away visiting her Exactly. <laughs> Same thing with putting wood in the microwave. I, I burned a bowl one time in the microwave. I now have a microwave in my shop. Uh, I went out and bought a junk one. <laughs> Because it took my wife about three months to get that smell out of there. <laughs> Not good. I have all kinds of homemade, like I have a hair dryer in my shop for bending wood. Uh, got an iron, I'm sure. Yeah, I got an iron yeah. that I use for other purposes. Uh, all kinds of things. Got an electric skillet. Uh, I, I heat uh, paraffin wax. It's full of melted paraffin wax all the time. Heat that up, dip the ends of green wood in there. Much faster than trying to paint it. And it works great. Uh, I dropped it one day. It splashed on my face. I thought, oh, you know, as it was coming up, I'm thinking, oh, this is going to hurt. <laughs> nah. So it's, what you do is you turn the skillet up until it just melts, about 160, 165 degrees. Um, and that's hot enough. The hard part was getting it out of my mustache. It, it didn't burn my face, but, boy, it was hard pulling it out of there. <laughs> but any other questions? Well, cool. I thank everybody for coming. John, appreciate it. Thank you.